Good evening and welcome to another edition of the COVID-19 pandemic update on Channels Television in collaboration with the Ford Foundation and Millicent Walker. Here are some of the highlights this hour. Today, Nigeria gets new chief of staff to the president. Federal Executive Council meeting conducted virtually. On our theme this evening, we analyze the welfare of Nigerian evacuees in the midst of limited bed space in the country and the financial struggle. And Lesotho becomes last African country to record the COVID-19. As the government battles to shield Nigerians at home from the clutch of COVID-19, it equally owes its citizens spread all over the world a duty of care and protection from the virus and its impact. Now, one of the major talking points in our coverage of the COVID-19 pandemic has been the government's handling and welfare of Nigerians in different parts of the world, caught in the web of travel restrictions put in place by different countries in the wake of the invisible attack of the coronavirus. Now let's take a cursory look at the timelines matters arising from the need to evacuate Nigerians. After the first case of COVID-19 announced the 27th of February in Nigeria in a bid to further protect its borders against the spread of the virus, the Nigerian government eventually put in place travel restriction barring incoming flights from 13 specific countries established to already have high incidence of COVID-19. This country is the UK, China, Japan, Iran, Switzerland, Norway, Netherlands, France, South Korea, Germany, Italy, Spain, and the US of A. Well, the travel restriction finally came into effect on the 21st of March, 2020. Now, don't forget that there are Nigerians in these countries who were either on their way back home or making plans to do so at the time of the ban, expectedly. The travel restriction left many, especially those on short visits to affected countries, stranded, creating panic, anger, and also frustration. Before we dive deeper into the social impact of the travel ban, let's give you a sense of how many Nigerians are abroad or overseas. Now, you can see here that 17 million Nigerians are abroad at a given time. And this image here is representative of the number of Nigerians. Uh, that's about 5 million. And we're talking about regions of the world, Antarctica, Asia, Australia, South America, and of course, Africa. And looking closely at the map here, of that figure, 5 million are in Europe alone. Now, since the need arose to bring Nigerians back from wherever they are in the wake of the pandemic, 4,000 Nigerians from 75 countries officially indicated that they would like to be evacuated and brought back home. This is because it has become impossible for them to do that independently after commercial aviation operations took the hit from the COVID-19 impact. So countries all over the world have had to resort to diplomatic means to evacuate their citizens. And we've seen a lot of that happen in recent weeks. Now, let's examine the social impact of the travel ban on 4,000 Nigerians who want to return home from 75 countries. Now, that is huge. So at this point, the numbers have escalated beyond Nigerians stranded in the 13 initial countries, which we showed to you, affected by the travel ban. There are others from other countries like India, France, Canada, Lebanon, Egypt, Sudan, and many more. So in classifying the evacuees, you would see that among the 4,000 Nigerians who want to return are those on perhaps short-term visits, uh, the elderly uh, families that are sick, and perhaps also returning students, professionals, and business people, also those on official trips. In fact, the list is endless. And when we look at that, uh, the next slide tells us about the cost this evacuation is having. Now, who is paying for the travels? Let's take a look at the numbers. Is it too much for the federal government to bear? They've said yes, that it is. And the estimated cost of return fluctuates between $1,300 and $1,700, depending on the airline or other factors. So if we're doing the maths from the worst case scenario, $1,700 multiplied by 4,000 Nigerians who want to come back home, the government would have to shell out about $6.8 million, roughly around 2.6 billion Naira. But is the federal government dodging the bullet here, saying each evacuee has to personally cover the cost of his return? Well, I guess you can fill in the gap. But so far, 
looking at the progress Nigeria has made in evacuating its citizens, um, in the last few days, we've seen the government execute evacuations in three countries, United Kingdom, the USFA, and of course, Dubai, about 250. And we hear some infants, eight infants came in uh, with the 160 Nigerians from the US safely returning home. Now, this report means that so far only 16.58% of Nigerians have been successfully evacuated, a total of about 663 people. The fact still remains that there are more than 300,000, or rather 3,300 Nigerians rather, waiting anxiously to be reunited with their families. And talking about families, one would expect that once the evacuees return, it will be into the waiting and loving arms of their family members. But no, the protocol is this, to ensure that both the returnees, the rest of the population, are adequately protected from further spread of the virus. The federal government is working with its relevant agencies like the NCDC uh, to take them in and hold them for 14 days where standard testing, screening and profiling would take place. Now, those who test positive to COVID-19 will be transferred to isolation centers and those will be taken care of uh, during the period of the quarantine. So essentially, these are also uh, the partnerships that the government is looking at in terms of uh, uh, those who are working with the government to ensure that things work out. Let's bring you more stories so far, and this is coming from the Federal Executive Council meeting. Uh, but before we bring you that story, the confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Nigeria today is 4,787 confirmed cases. Today's figures from the Nigeria Center for Disease Control says puts the number of patients that have been discharged at 959 and deaths at 158. The new cases were recorded in 19 states as of last night. The regional figure shows the city leading in the southwest and the country in Lagos with 1,990 cases, followed by Kano in the northwest with 693 cases. The FCT in the north central has 360 cases. Bochi has displaced Borno in the northeast with cases in the state rising to 190. Edo State still leads in the south-south with 88 cases and Enugu leads in the southeast. Now, 13 patients, including six health workers in Bochi State, have recovered from the coronavirus and have been discharged from the state's isolation centers. While the number of casualties recorded in the state has increased to three, the Commissioner for Health, Dr. Aliyu Maigoro, confirmed this today, where he says there are no severe cases being managed, and so far, over 1,500 people have been tested for the virus in the state. From the day we admitted our first index case to date, uh, we have a total of 23 discharges. Uh, yesterday, we received a 13 uh, people who satisfy the criteria for discharge, and we have discharged them this morning. We had a period of like two weeks without having more much cases. Since after the six confirmed cases within Bauchi from the first index case, we have spent like one to two weeks with only one or three cases. And you know, in COVID-19 protocol, the, based on the criteria on our standard operating procedure, we have to wait for at least two weeks. So most of these cases that we see, we recorded them within the last 10 to 13 days. And we recorded almost up to like uh, more than 100 and about 50 cases within uh, less than two weeks. So, and because of that, we have to wait. So these patients, they are in their waiting period. But I believe, as you can see from yesterday, we recorded uh, 13 new cases that are pre and they are discharged. So we are hoping very soon where we are going to do more discharges, especially in those group that came in 10, in 27, in 40 something. So most of this group, if they are tested negative, we are going to discharge them. So let's talk some more about the evacuation situation. And joining us in the studio is a former World Bank consultant health specialist, Mr. Babatunde Ipaye. He is a public health specialist, former HIV and health advisor, uh, to the UK, DFID in Nigeria, former Commissioner for Health, Ogun State. Uh, thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you, Melissa. All right.
presently, um, according to the Foreign Affairs Minister, some of our medical experts advise that it is not essential to test, and that's before um, our Nigerians abroad return. Uh, but it's just enough to observe physical distancing in the plane and coming on the plane and coming back. And of course, the wearing of face masks. Would you subscribe to this? No, of course, that is not the, that is not the uh, uh, global standard. The expectation that people should test, especially now when you're coming from countries with high you know, prevalence of the disease. So that is the expectation. But of course, if that is not possible, the other options becomes, uh, you know, what will come into play. But I am happy that the first thing that uh, the federal government has adopted is to have a system of quarantine rather than, uh, you know, expecting the returnees to maintain some degree of social distance. If you recall, it was the expectation of the government that those who returned from the UK when we did not, you know, shut down early, early enough, the expectation was that they needed to self-isolate. And many of those people broke, particularly people in high places, actually broke the self-isolation rule. And that, that is what is causing the epidemic in Nigeria today. So to expect that people will obey is, 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 is to assume that the miracle will happen, especially in a country where people love to socialize. For a number of people who want to come back, are a bit skeptical and perhaps scared that they would also be, you know, in a place, share toilets with perhaps people who might be positive. Uh, with COVID-19? My, my expectation, of course, we saw, you know, what happened when the, the returnees came. Um, what we saw was not what is expected, especially when Nigeria had a month, okay, between when the international airport was were closed and when the evacuation took place. It, it also reflects um, our, our ability uh, not to plan effectively, because my expectation is that when you have the kind of numbers that you have projected in a population of 200 million people, it shouldn't be difficult to isolate them in such a, a condition. I mean, you're talking about less than 700 Nigerians. And if the fundamental objective of government is actually the protection of life and properties, including the life of the 200 million Nigerians that are not exposed, or 190 something million Nigerians that are yet to be exposed, and the issue around social justice, I think we, Nigeria, yes, we, are, we don't have enough resources, but it is not as bad as not having resources to actually take care of those numbers. It is just about careful planning and implementation of plans. Yes, because the government has cried about the availability of hotels as isolation centers, and we're really, having really limited really bed really spaces. Really sent, really sent, you you know, don't believe that. I have, I have engaged in, I, I was a commissioner in, in, in Nigeria, and so I, I, I see some of the challenges in the public space. I've also worked within the development space to see the problem in Nigeria when it comes to planning. You see, the issue around here is that we do not we do not make enough careful projections and anticipate events. We, yes, granted, Nigeria is a is a country where we believe in religion and there's a lot of churches and we know miracles do happen, but some of these things needs to be properly and carefully prepositioned. Okay, do you know the numbers of hotel in Abuja? Do you know the number of guest houses? In, do you know the number of abandoned government properties everywhere in Nigeria? So, what needs to have happened? is that some people must, should have done you know, due diligence and to map resources that are available, okay, and make sure that those available resources are properly utilized about efficiency management. That, that's what we need to do. Because if you go to Abuja, I tell you, there are more unoccupied houses than occupied houses in some parts of Abuja. All right. Okay, there, there, are, more, there are more abandoned you know, government projects <laughs> that are completed or utilized in Abuja that can be used. The, the other time, Catholic Hospital came out to say we have funded and these are resources that ordinarily should have been mapped some three purpose. weeks ago. And then when we carefully, you know, bring everybody on board and the kind of resources that people have generously donated, you know, can actually respond to many of these expectations if they are efficiently managed. All right. We appreciate your time from a World Bank consultant health specialist, Mr. Babasuni Pai. Thank you for joining us on the program. It's a pleasure. So to come on our COVID-19 update on the second half of the program, more rights violations are still being recorded across the country following the coronavirus pandemic. The executive secretary of the NHRC joins us on the program. That's in a moment.
And it's called the Incident Action Plan document produced by the Edo State COVID-19 response team containing a record of all its activities since its inauguration. And the paperwork has been approved by the Governor, Gordon Obasaki, speaking after the presentation at the Government House. The Commissioner for Health, Dr. Patrick Okundia, said the state government came up with a plan since the inception of the virus to deal with the pandemic spread. He added that the present stage of the COVID-19 plan focuses more on screening and testing across the 18 local government areas. All the budgetary uh, allocations, expenditures, the strategic planning, including all the pillar responsibilities are captured in this document. This document took the state, the tax force, a lot of time, weeks, and hard work to prepare. Now, it also speaks to the fact that the response to coronavirus disease in the state has been, like we always said, is data-driven. And it's followed a long process of research and planning. This is what this document uh, speaks to. And we are happy that uh, at the end of the day, we have a document to say this is our response to COVID-19 in Edo State. The stage we are now is about screening, get more people out of the community who will be screened and they come out positive, we bring them out and isolate and treat. That way, the aim is to flatten the curve of coronavirus disease in Edo State. And we are on top of it. The National Youth Service Corps, NYC, is a creation of the Nigerian government to compel the Nigerian youth complete a mandatory service for one year. But you would imagine how difficult that task is to perform at a period when the coronavirus is sweeping through the nation. The Ogun State, in Ogun State, rather, some NYC medical personnel posted to the state are helping out their senior colleagues at different isolation centers. The NYC State Coordinator, Mrs. Belinda Fanny, who seems excited about this, is also giving a thumbs up to the core members as she also commends others attached to the Skills Acquisition Center for producing over 9,000 face masks, which has been donated to the Ogun State Government. The National Human Rights Commission, NHRC, says it received a total of 104 complaints bordering on human rights violations between April the 13th and May the 4th as against 105 complaints it received within two weeks in its earlier report. In its update on human rights violations during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the Commission reveals that it received complaints from 27 states of the Federation. The report shows Enugu State has the highest recorded cases with 13 incidents, unlike Lagos that had the highest cases with 28 incidents in its earlier report followed by Emo State, which had 12 incidents, Aquaibom and Nassara are next, recording 10 incidents each, while Delta and Abia States recorded 9 and 7 incidents, respectively. Lagos State recorded 5 cases, FCT Abuja and Benue States recording 4 each, followed by Niger, Zamfara, Oshu and River States with 3 incidents each, and Anambra, Jigawa, Bayelsa, Edo States recording 2 each, and the other states, Ogun, Kogi, Bornu, Gombe, Kaduna, Adamawa, Eboi, Kano, Cross River, Ekiti States, recording one incident each. It says that it received undocumented complaints in areas of extrajudicial killings, violation of rights to freedom of movement, unlawful arrest and detention, and many others with regards to the violations. While the Executive Secretary of the National Human Rights Commission of Nigeria, NHRC, Mr. Tony Njuku, joins us on the program from Abuja Studio. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Millicent. Now, let's start with what you can confirm to us. And this is about what we're hearing uh, was trending via social media today, uh, that a 300-level student of history and international studies at the University of Joss was said to have been shot uh, by men of the Nigerian army. Um, have you heard about this story? What can you confirm to us? Yes, I'm in touch with my office in Joss, and um, the state coordinator just came back from the um, police um, and contacted the Army High Command uh, Operation uh, Safe Heavens, and they confirmed that the, the Army officer has been arrested and 
he will be surrendered for investigation and uh, other necessary steps will be taken. But the officer is now in custody. I know that following the, the report of um, the earlier report of the phase down, um, this report has come again. But in the earlier reports, uh, so far 18 deaths, most of the culprits were uh, security agencies. But looking at this report, April 13 to May 5th, who are the major culprits of the violations? Well, the. Of course, the people who are enforcing the lockdown are security agencies. So definitely, the the violators will also be security agencies. Now, out of the eleven uh, extrajudicial killings we had from fourteenth uh, of April to the third uh, of May, um, seven of them were attributable to the action of uh, the Nigerian police. Um, there's also some attributable to the Nigerian Security and Civil Defense Corps. And also, you have the activities of the uh, state uh, tax forces. Uh, these are the people who have been responsible for the extrajudicial killings. And of course, uh, there have been other kinds of violations like you would um, see. There has been the issue, constant case of extortion of uh, most of the uh, people who violated the um, COVID-19 lockdown. And some of the transporters who are conveying uh, food materials, for instance, uh, conveying medical supplies, uh, they are stopped and they, they have to pay money before they can proceed on their journeys. And also there have been cases of um, um, unlawful arrest and detention. There have been cases of uh, um, violation of the right to movement of medical personnel and members of the press who, of course, were exempted, who are on the front lines of the uh, enforcement of the COVID-19 and uh, as well as uh, enlightenment of the people and uh, treating people in the hospital. Such people are not supposed to be uh, stopped from carrying out their, their duties. But... Um, we realize that some of the law enforcement agents did so. But the Mr. good thing is that um, um, all these things have been documented and we have a protocol with the residential tax force on COVID-19 and all these violations have been communicated to the respective agencies, uh, namely the, 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 the correctional services, the civil defense corps, the Nigerian police, uh, the state tax offices, the Nigerian army, and um, they are studying these complaints and we have been assured by the government that all these uh, complaints will be investigated properly and those who are responsible will be made to account. Of course, you also notice that in some cases, um, even the police has uh, already arrested some of the officials, put them through early room trial, some of them have been demoted. Some of them uh, are being tried in court. Uh, in the case of the army, some of the officers have been arrested and are going, through, going to go through the court martial system. So we're expecting that um, these cases will all be investigated and uh, all those who are responsible will be made to account for, for the violations. Indeed, and that is all what Nigerians are expecting, especially uh, seeing that uh, we hope we, we don't get a lot more of these violations and they can be brought to a halt. We'd like to thank you, Executive Secretary, National Human Rights Commission, Mr. Tony Juku. Thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you very much, Melissa. Now, Lesotho has confirmed its first case of coronavirus, becoming the last country in Africa to record the virus. The Mountain Kingdom is completely surrounded by South Africa, which has 11,350 cases of COVID-19. The single case resulted from tests done on 81 travelers from South Africa and Saudi Arabia. For weeks, there have been questions about how Lesotho had managed to stab off the disease in spite of the frequent movement of people between the two neighbours. Uh, to date, uh, they have sent 595 specimens for testing. We hear that 295 are negative and 301 are still pending.
Of course, NCDC continues to work closely with states. You can find the latest national strategy to scale up access to coronavirus disease testing in Nigeria and other public health advisories. Same with the World Health Organization. It has a, a regular updates about the spread of the pandemic. That's our COVID-19 special edition on Channel's Television in collaboration with the Ford Foundation. Thank you for watching. I'm Millicent Walker. Until next time, wash your hands and wear your face masks.